Follow the Star to the Neapolitan Christmas by Terry Mahoney, narrated by Becky Allen, photography by Andy Allen. In America, we call the scene of the birth of Christ the Nativity. But there are a variety of terms used around the world for Nativity. In Germany, Krippe initially meant manger and later applied to the entire Christmas scene. In France, the Nativity is called creche, the word for manger, nursery, or nativity scene. In Italy, percep from the Latin percepio, which leads us to the topic of our presentation the Neapolitan Christmas, or Persepio, of the 18th and 19th century. This was the golden age of the Persepio, which came about through the encouragement of the church and royal patronage of the arts. Naples was the capital and was ruled by Spanish Bourbon kings who reigned from 1735 to 1860, with a short exile during Napoleon's occupation. As a point of reference, these grand Persepios were happening at the time George Washington was President of the United States. The Persepio grew to awesome proportions under the encouragement of these Spanish Bourbon kings. Most notable were Carlo II and later Fernando IV. Even during his exile in 1800, Fernando IV had a crib of no less than 6,000 square feet containing 5,950 figures. These persepios were inspired by contemporary still life paintings. Please notice how this, these persepios resembled the paintings of this period. There are many scenes within the creche and it mingles religious figures with everyday life, the mythical with the factual. The persepio is a sight to behold and needs to be viewed from many angles to truly enjoy it in its entirety. The centerpiece of the creche is the depiction of the birth of Christ. The villagers, magi, peasants, and tradesmen are all layered in to add a rich texture to the story being told. A temple in ruins is often used for the setting rather than a stable, which is architecturally proper for the time and place, but is also symbolic of a triumph of Christianity over paganism. The Holy Family are outfitted in traditional period biblical costume, while the townspeople are dressed and styled in contemporary 18th and 19th century Naples attire. A good way to tell if you have a member of the Holy Family or a saint is that they always have a small hole high in the back of their head for the placement of their halo, which can be very simple as the set, as the set illustrated here, and some halos are very elaborate. Neapolitan figures are different from other European and even Italian figures. They have very expressive heads, usually made from terracotta with insect glass eyes. A layer of gesso gives a smooth finish into which details are sculpted, including eyelids, moles, or veins, creating an extraordinary lifelike qualities to these figures. The figures are most commonly found in sizes 8 to 15 inches tall. Joseph usually wears violet, green, or gold to represent the colors of the soul's union with God. He is always placed looking down at Mary and the babe. Note his expression and the details in his face. Both Mary and he always have very shapely feet with toes and are typically wearing sandals. One of the most stunning features of the Virgin Mary is her gentle, serene expression. She has hooded eyes downcast as if she is always looking down at the baby. She usually wears a white or pink dress with a blue mantle to represent the heavens. It is hard to get a good photo of Mary due to her downcast eyes. Please take a moment to appreciate the beauty and peacefulness about her. And now we present the baby Jesus, the driving force of the entire crush scene. Naked in his incarnation, he is the perfect second Adam. The next traditional element is the adoration of the shepherds. 
The Sherpas are considered humble people at the lower end of the social spectrum. They are always dressed in homespun coarse cotton or linen garments, often with fur-like vests and traditional pe peasant leather sandals. This shepherd is Bernino, the sleeping shepherd. He got his name from the character in an Italian opera in which he awakens from a deep sleep only to tell about his wonderful dream of a glorious infant being born in a dark grotto in Bethlehem. Benino, to some people, symbolizes a failure to acknowledge and recognize Christ as the Messiah, but the, to the Neapolitans, he is the shepherd that dreams of the crash in the crash. Old legend has it that he should not be aw awakened, lest the crash itself will vanish into thin air. Here is a close-up of the shepherd boy showing his clothes, wind-blown hair, and a look of awe with his mouth open. Another sweet boy carrying some bread for all of them to eat. The next scene is the glorification of a heavenly host of angels, which represents the angels coming to worship Christ and celebrate his birth. Angels have no holes in their feet. Angels are usually barefoot with their well-modeled feet, arched or angled as if in flight, although occasionally an angel is shod with sandals. It is likely those with sandals represented the angel of Annunciation or those who st stood guard over the Christ child. Eyes are usually downcast looking at Jesus. They usually wear flowing silk garments in which the hems have a sewn-in fine copper wire that can be positioned to make it appear to be flowing in the wind. Here we are trying to show how the wings are placed. Later in the program we will show you a unattached angel wing that has a small nail coming out of it. This nail is stuck down into the back of the body and the angels are sp suspended in the air over the Holy Family so they appear to be airborne. Here we are showing the thin wire which would be used to hang the angel up in the air to make her appear as though she was flying. With the insertion of the wings just sticking into the body and with no other support and the angel being almost horizontal, it is no wonder we find so many angels without her wings. This angel has most likely been redressed, but she depicts a wonderful hairdo to illustrate windblown hairstyles. The wooden wings are white, like dove wings with hints of color at the tips. Angels typically carry censers, which are used to burn incense. These are what every Neapolitan crush collector covets, as they are extraordinarily detailed works of art. It is extremely hard to find an angel in very good condition with her wings intact due to their flying over the scenes. This grouping shows the three types of angels used in the Persepo. The clothed angel, which we have already talked about, the Pudi, or cherubs, and the Capazel d'Angelo, literally meaning little angel heads. The little angel heads, which represent the purest of angels in Neapolitan crests, are depicted without bodies and are just busts with wings coming from their shoulders and surround the holy trio. The Pudi resembled winged children and are strictly used to be decorative. Next came the arrival of the Magi, or wise men, with their exo own exotic entourage of people, animals, and luxuries. The Magi, or the three wise men, allowed the craftsmen of these elaborate Persepios fantasies to be indulged, and the imagination was allowed to run wild with exotic costumes, diversity of people, animals such as elephants, monkeys, and camels, and the most elaborate of accessories. The clothes of the Magi were especially eye-catching in wonderful bright colors and elaborate fabrics including silk turbans, Ottoman-style trousers, capes, and everything trimmed with gold braids or fringes.
Please note this young man's detailed carved hair and pudgy round nose with large nostrils. He is likely a young prince or a member of the royal court. The wise men represented not only biblical men, but the Europeans' perception of the exotic beast. As was custom back in that time, the rich patrons could pay to have their likenesses made or someone they admired created to put into the crash scenes. In many of the Neapolitan nativity scenes, the actual event was often enhanced by scenes of everyday life, such as market and street depictions. The market stalls contained fruit, vegetables, meat, fish, seafood, and poultry. Every conceivable item for daily use in homes or shops or for general consumption found its way into the Presepio. The attention to detail was phenomenal. Delicious foods were as much a part of the Presepio as in everyday Italian life and included terracotta or wax produce, as well as breads, cheeses, and meats of every variety and sometimes even the vermin these tasty treats attracted. They primarily used wax for food items to create realistic fresh fruits and vegetables. Those made of wooden clay and then painted with oil paints tended to lose their look of freshness over time. The wax pieces amazingly still look fresh today. The mingling of animals with humans was typical of daily life in rural Naples, and they can be found throughout the crash scenes in unfenced courtyards. Most animals were made of terracotta with glass eyes. The animals are very difficult to find today and fairly expensive. Some of the animals are dogs, cats, chickens, hogs, cattle, horses, pigeons, goats, sheep, turkeys, rabbits, and then the Magi group included other animals such as monkeys, camels, exotic birds, and elephants. Artisans who created the villagers displayed in the village scenes modeled them to depict the ordinary people of the 18th and 19th century based on images that wealthy people and noble families had of ordinary town folk. This might explain the frequency with which social outsiders are represented, dwarfs, beggars, cripples, and other caricatures of human weaknesses. He appears to have been a shepherd, but has lost his sight. Note his five o'clock shadow. It can not only be seen, but felt. These two are among my favorite Neapolitan crush figures, along with angels and hags. They are incredible characterizations of the poor and disenfranchised people. The larger figure is missing several teeth. The smaller woman has a large goiter. Andy did a wonderful job taking this close-up of her goiter. This one is so large. A goiter can be caused by an iodine deficiency to the thyroid gland, and fortunately today is something that can be easily treated. Crush figures are made up of five pieces and a body the terracotta head and wooden arms and legs. They are arranged on an iron wire frame which is bound generously with tow cloth, like hemp, to form the torso. When new, they can be bent to assume any human position, though after two centuries it can be risky to try to change a stance taken years ago. Many are frozen in time. The shoulder heads, much like a typical antique doll shoulder head, were tied to toe-covered bodies with strong hemp-like string. There are more than 30 crush artists known by name, and there are many signed heads. But the difficulty in verifying if your doll is signed is that you have to remove the clothes, then remove the shoulder head as the signature is on the inside of the shoulder head, if it is signed at all. Here is an array of various parts. Earlier dolls tend to have carved wooden hands and feet, while the later ones are made of terracotta. Every style of footwear is evident among the dolls from carved stockings, shoes, boots, or sandals, depending on what the character needed to complete his costume. Note, 
the angel wing with the single nail to hold the body, the wing to her body. The soles of the feet or shoes have holes in them to fit over wooden or metal pins and bases when displayed in the crush scene. This enables the figures to stand without visible support. Often you will find the doll or base numbered so that they know where to place it in the scene. It's hard to see the photo in the photo, but the pins are different heights, widths, and some slant to one side. A careful and studied use of perspective allowed for great dimension in the Presepio settings and they placed larger figures in front and smaller ones in the distance and above eye level. All these techniques trick the eye, giving an increased effect and scope of the panorama. These five figures range in height from 8 to 15 inches tall. This photo gives a side-by-side -side comparison showing the smallest man standing 8 inches tall and the larger man standing 14 inches tall. These figures would have been used in the same Persepio. The larger man would be in the foreground, the small figure high above to give the scene dimension. All the major trades and occupations of Naples find their way into the Persepio. The butcher, the ricotta vendor, the chestnut vendor, the baker, the farmer are all portrayed as well as townsfolk and common folk. Here we show a casually attired butcher displaying his highly detailed torso with his pig. What helps these figures seem so totally lifelike is their clothing, which was created in astonishing detail. The clothing when taken apart is simply pieces of various materials layered and pinned or stitched together that gives a look of a complete outfit. The clothing was often lined with plain paper. Occasionally some of the lining paper has Italian words printed on it. Shown here is a wonderful innkeeper and his lovely wife. These ladies show us a typical colorful Neapolitan regional garb with elaborate aprons. They are the typical beautiful young ladies you find in the classic Persepio scenes. This lady wears a pair of beautifully intricate earrings of gold accented with pearls and rubies. The workmanship is unbelievable on something so small. This jewelry was made from the same quality gold and silver that was used by jewelers who produced full-size jewelry for the royal patrons. Notice the grape she holds. Each grape was hand-dipped in wax. This beautiful woman wears another lovely pair of gold, turquoise, and pearl earrings. Also, she has a common style coral necklace. Coral was often carried or worn, as it was believed to ward off evil, so Neapolitans often had a piece of coral in their pockets. These men are dressed in the typical style of the Neapolitan men of the times. The older man carries an Italian style set of bagpipes as music was very much a part of daily life. The bagpipes are made of wood and a cured bladder or stomach. This close-up is to show how the eyes are hand-cut and uneven, giving him a little cockeyed look that makes him endearing. This shows a grouping of different molded headgear for both men and women. The back view is sh showing the detailing of the folds of the two hats to give a real lifelike look. Please notice the brush strokes of hair on the woman's neck. This woman has an elegant Grecian look. Her elaborate outfit has a lot of intricate gold braiding. Here is a close-up of her wonderful face with deeply molded eyelids, aquiline nose, and a mouth with slightly parted lips. The detail on this doll is extraordinary and she is only 12 inches tall. A close-up view of her intricate hairdo and ribbons intertwined in her, in her hairstyle.
Here's another exotic gentleman, not, a t not typical of Neapolitan daily life. He appears to be a soldier, maybe from the Ottoman Empire, based on his hairstyle and clothing. As you can see from the photo, the silk is melting and the gold thread are heavy and cutting into the fabric. This photo shows you his unusual way his beard grows. His nickname is Dairy Queen because of how his beard curls to look like ice cream cones. Typically, you find more adults than children in the Presepio. When children are found, they are typically more young men than young girls because boys are shown doing chores or serving as young apprentices to the trades. These two young girls were, are well-dressed, most likely daughters of townsfolk. Notice the girl on the left has short hair and her dress is above her ankles. She is designed to represent a young child. Her companion is an older girl. Her longer hair is swept into a bun and her dress is full length. Her character face is distinctive with big eyes and prominent front teeth. This is something ver that you see very commonly in Presepios, mothers with babies. It is not unusual to see a mother with her one breast exposed to nurse her baby. The babies are usually swaddled with only their heads showing. It is rare in a crash scene to find eyeglasses, and these are noteworthy. Supposedly, the first pair of wearable eyeglasses was invented in Italy in the 13th century. The golden age of the Presepio happened mainly due to an early encouragement of the church. In later years, however, some church leaders would frown on these large flamboyant dis displays. The church sounded the alarm and the art form fell from grace. Also, the great and noble patrons were facing another economic realities and could no longer afford this luxury. Many large sets were dismantled as few individuals could house these huge theatrical settings and so single or small groups of dolls found their way into collections, museums, attics, or cellars. The initial breakup of many of the great presepios came with the occupation by Napoleon's army at the very end of the 18th century. A number of them were taken out of Italy as souvenirs by soldiers who had taken them in trade for candy bars or cigarettes. A large Neapolitan collection was purchased in 1955 by an American named Loretta Hines Howard. It was the Eugene Catello's Adoration of the Angels that consisted of an outstanding flock of over 50 angels that earlier had been exhibited in Paris. This collection was displayed in the family home and then two years later the tree was recreated for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 1965 Howard gifted the collection to the museum and it has become an annual awe-inspiring 30-foot angel tree exhibit. The marvelous workmanship and exquisite detail of these dolls that look like actual people frozen in a moment of time are still today the most magical qualities of the Neapolitan Presepio. Andy and I would like to thank our friend Terry Mahoney for sharing her beautiful collection of crush figures and writing this very well-researched script. Andy and I would like to wish all our fellow doll and teddy bear collectors attending the Christmas pageant activities a very Merry Christmas and a happy, healthy New Year. We'd also like to thank Rachel for keeping us all connected during this difficult time. Her conventions are a true bright spot for collectors everywhere.